me. I'm Norman Graham. Nineteen forty-four was my privilege to found jazz at the Philharmonic. I used to go to as many nightclubs in Los Angeles as had good music, particularly the Nat Cole Trio and the Tatum Trio. The big bands would come through town and they might sit down at the theater for two, three, four weeks, like Basie or Duke, and of course you'd, you'd go see them. Number one, without question, Norman Grant's the greatest jazz producer who ever lived. Norman's one of the most important and innovative figures in music. Fred Astaire would come up to 451 North Cannon and uh, he'd bring Norman a pair of pink socks from the dime store. And I said, my God, what are these for? And, and he said, just give them to Norman and tell him I'm sending my love for the other night. And you sense the power he controls within himself. And uh, so the whole 12 years I handled him, 12, 13 years, uh, I was always a little bit uh, afraid of him. <laughs> he was athletic. He was a good, he was speedy, a, a good basketball and tennis star. He was a star in our high school. Norm was successful in all that he did. To uh, promote civil rights in the 1940s, uh, I mean, you were taking your own life in your hands. I went to get in this cab to go to, go to the hotel. And uh, the policeman said, you can't get in that cab. Get out of the cab. It was one of those things. I know Norman walked up. He, did, he just happened to walk up. I wanted to know what was going on. And he told me, he said, don't pay me money. Fitz, get in the cab. And he had the big 38 or whatever he was wearing on his hip. He said, she's not getting in that cab. I said, she's not. She's not. He said, get in the cab. If you want the cab, get in it. It's free. It's free for anyone. And with that, he pulled out his gun. He stuck it in Norman's stomach. He said, you know something, I hate you worse than I hate them. One of those scenes. You know. And I said, well, if you hate me that bad, he pulled the trigger. But he said, she's getting in the cab anyway. And of course, he, he backed off. But Norman had no fear that way. You know, he, he just believed what he believed in equality, and that was it. I was pricing the house. I asked the question that I usually had to, uh, do you have any segregation? He said, well, the, the blacks sit upstairs in the balcony. And I said, well, Norman wouldn't like that. They shouldn't. He said, but, they, but the blacks like it up there. And I said, well, maybe they do, but there can't be any segregation. And Norman, I told him the conversation, and uh, he canceled that concert. These people, with some exceptions, idolized Norman Grants. Number one, you could say accurately that he took some of these people out of the gutter, you might say, and put them onto the highway. Their careers were changed, their whole pace structure was changed, and these people, because of Norman, were able to earn very comfortable livings, and Norman protected that. When he was instructing me on um, going where Jazz Philharmonic needed to be uh, promoted, he told me how he scaled the house, and this lovely philanthropic man had the lowest price was $10, and $10 seats were the top row of the top balcony, and that's all. And then it went up from there, you know, 35 and 50 and so forth. So down the orchestra was pretty pricey. But his logic was that these poor wretches who worked all week long and didn't make much money and saved it all to go to the concert, they'd get to the box office on Friday, and they'd say, no, the $10 seats are all gone. Now they're there. Well, they might as well splurge and get the next highest. And so... Uh, that was what made him rich, I think, at the beginning. He knew what songs to play, and he knew what the public, even the jazz public or general public, what they wanted. You listen to it. You compare. Nobody has to tell you anything. You just listen. 
And finally, if your ear is at all good or if you have good taste, it'll come up. He had an ear to know what, what is good music, because I don't think he ever thought that they were going to make him a million dollars. He was listening to it musically rather than something commercially to make him a million dollars. There were some guys that never would have been heard of again if it hadn't been for Norman. You know, these guys who had all this history of music inside them and needing to be heard, they wouldn't have been heard. Verve Records not only was, but is, one of the most important labels in the recording of the history of jazz. Verve Records was one of the, probably the premier jazz labels. Uh, anytime you have an Ella Fitzgerald on the, on the label, the uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Lake, all these people that, he, that you have, it's, it's, it's the label you want to be on. You know, uh, you always want to be with the, the best there are. And, and, and Norman Granz, no, he, Pablo, Verve, he had a whole bunch of labels that he put together. And every one of them were, were big successes in jazz. Yeah, Norman Granz was a heavyweight. Clap hands, here come Charlie. Clap hands, good time Charlie. Clap hands, here come Charlie now. I think he was brilliant for Ella. Brilliant. I mean, where else was Ella going to get that kind of exposure and let alone the money. She was his baby. He really took great care of her. He made sure that there was a suite of rooms for her. There was, it was all first class. Norman and Sinatra, there was a hatred there. And Norman told me that it was because Sinatra wanted to buy the Verve label. I think Norman would have sold it to anybody as long as he didn't have to sell it to Sinatra. He and Ella Fitzgerald uh, fell out and um, uh, he didn't like to talk about her. He said to me, ah, she was such a nightmare. And then I said, well, wait a minute, you, uh, you're you telling me that I don't know anything about music? We got down to that one, one of those things. Huh? And I said, no, I'm not telling you you don't know anything about music, but I'm just telling you you're wrong. You know, and I, wouldn't give, I wouldn't give in. And Benny Green intervened and said, now listen, you two are getting into an argument. And Norman said, wait a minute. I have an opinion. I'm allowed to have my opinion. I said, yeah, but you're not playing. I wouldn't give any quarter. I said, you're not the one playing. I'm playing. You're not. And we came to a point of total disagreement that night. We didn't speak for two years. He was assuming that people, each generation of jazz fans, would be interested in the great players and be interested in the works that he created with them. And I think time has proved him much more than right. It has proved him to be absolutely prescient in this particular matter. Anytime you listen to some wonderful, wonderful jazz, and you see jazz the Philharmonic, or indeed you see an album by Oscar or Ella, and it's right there, and that's Norman's legacy. Norman Grant's demeanor didn't change at all. He remained the same son of a bitch he always was. He was a good man. Damn good. <laughs>